Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Mastering Dungeons. I'm Sean Merwin, here with the long-suffering Teos Avedia. <laughs> hey, Teos, thanks for coming back uh, after a couple of weeks without me. You know, I missed you, man. I really did. Uh, yeah. It was, it was, yeah, it was kind of funny. I was like, oh man, like, like I feel like there's been show because I like listened to you record two episodes, and then I record an episode without you, and I'm like, I miss my Shondos. So. Yeah, well, it's it's been almost a month, so we are back. We are better than ever. We are going to talk a lot of role playing games and D and D. Indeed, you like doing that? Oh, I I love that. All right, I love it much. Let's get to. It, then. It is going to start with our listener corner with several questions that have piled up in the interim. First being from Kurt Ogle, 4576, via YouTube. And Kurt asks, do you have GM tools and tricks that you might recommend regarding emphasizing and reinforcing tone? And the question goes on, but I want to stop right there for a second mm -hmm. and say... Tone is one of those words that means different things to different people. Often it's used synonymously with setting, with mood, with theme, with atmosphere. But technically, tone is the creator's relationship to their own work, to their own content. So if you think of the phrase, I don't like your tone, it's not talking about what the person said. It's talking about how they said it. Mm. So it's more about the delivery than the content. So if you tell a very grandiose story, uh, or a simple story in a very grandiose way, your tone is sort of sarcastic. Mm. You recognize the fact that it's really not a huge story, but you're telling it like it is. So that's sort of like the mock epic, like Ulysses uh, yeah. by James Joyce. If you tell a like a terrible, dark story but use a humorous tone we might call it dark humor or gallows humor right mm -hmm. that's that's the tone right that's the relationship between the person creating and that content so the question i think is asking more about mood or atmosphere or even theme than right. the theme. than tone mm -hmm. yeah so so let's talk about that uh, setting a tone, clear tone. This is the rest of the question. Setting a clear tone for a game overall scene location or situational mood can help guide character role play that helps capture the theme setting and genre of the game in a satisfying way. In games with heavy player investment before a scene, my players and I often indicate the tone we're going for before we jump in, and it has created wild levels of immersion and drama. So, you know, Kurt asks this question and then sort of answers it. Yeah. Uh, because tone and mood and atmosphere is something that you want to set as an expectation with your players beforehand. And then you can work toward reinforcing that or diverge from it in surprising and fun ways. Uh, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, I mean, I think we can look to 5e products to see examples of where tone or, you know, this kind of general concept uh, both works and doesn't work, right? So, like, I think a, one that really stands out to me is Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. When we were told by the initial kind of marketing waves, right, it was all about how it's like the thing and it's uh, horror and, and being alone in the ice kind of concept. And then, you know, you, you sit down and you look at the first session you're going to run. And one of the options is sort of like find the missing Chewinga, which mm -hmm. is cute and not yeah. really horrifying. Right. And it's a, f a fun scene. Totally great. But if what you're going for is that particular tone, then you may want to adjust it. Now, the other uh, option is a little more along those lines. And so that can that can work that way. And, and, and it can be great to have both options. But to the extent that the tone you're driving at is a particular one. Then you want to go that way, right? Or uh, one that I like to play with a lot in my games is when someone uses some sort of divination. You can tailor that to the campaign world, right? You can, mm -hmm. uh, or even you're handing out magic items. Like in in, in Dark Sun, I had um, sort of shriveled dried fruit that someone gave that was a potion of healing, and it had come from from this particular sort of sage like character. 
And when and not only was it this sort of like, you know, kind of nasty old I mean, not nasty, but it was it was looked old and withered, right? Like it like it was barely clinging to being a fruit, which is very appropriate for a dark sun setting. And when you mm -hmm. ate it, not only did you get its restorative effects, but you got a sort of vision of either the past or the future related to your character. And so that kind of thing, you know, was just a simple way for me to remind you, you're not in a place that just has liquids sitting around in bottles, right? It's got to be in some other form. And that's, di and the whole world is different. So here's some differences to how a potion works, right? And then that, that establishes that. Yeah, for sure. That's the, that was going to be my second point, which is the details that you use will help set the tone. And, you know, like you, your potion example is a perfect example, right? A potion of healing in one campaign can be much different than a potion of healing in another campaign. And, you know, think of imagery or symbolism in stories, mm -hmm. right? It's it's setting that expectation of everything that we say is going to come back to these images and these themes. And so just, just think in terms of those details and also allow your players to experiment with their own themes even if you say this is going to be a horror game you can let things you know keep coming back to those themes but let things play out in in sort of a different tone or a different atmosphere uh just to alleviate the heavy heaviness of a tone because if it's the same beat over and over and over and over again you can lose the story in that. So to give a contrasting atmosphere or a contrasting theme or tone right. can be helpful in reestablishing exactly where your campaign or your story or your adventure is within that tone. Though the, there are times, right, and I think DMs struggle with this, like you're trying to do that epic moment, you know, in the big battle and the players are just kind of cracking silly jokes and you're like, that's not what your characters should be doing, right? And and that can be hard. And so it can be worth talking to players sometimes and saying like, hey, let's have a yeah. blast. And 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 there are times, like if you think of like the D&D movie or Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, there are times when things are, the chips are down, but you can crack jokes. But there's certain kinds of jokes because you are still focused on the mission. Mm -hmm. You are still worried about what's going on. And But players sometimes just step out and forget about w what's actually happening at the yeah. table, right? And that's when it can be worth correcting that to have that tone mesh a little more closely. Right. Assuming that's what you want. Assuming mm -hmm. that's what the players want. Right. And and that's what I mean about tone being the, the delivery rather than the content. Because you can run a dark, horror, Ravenloft, gothic campaign where what the characters are going through is dark. But what the gameplay is is comedy. And that's that's totally fine as long as that's what you and your players want, and so that's why a tone can be the the atmosphere and the tone can be two very different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Next, we have M D Black Rabbit via Mastodon saying, as game designers working with RPG systems with classes. What considerations do you make in terms of creating a new class versus a new subclass for an existing one versus having a player simply multi-class for variations of playable characters? I ask for those DMs that allow or create homebrew items for their players, and it would be it would be valuable to understand some of those considerations to maximize the play experience as intended. Now, I'm going to let you go first on this, Mateus. Well, I, I'm no expert, but I'll, I'll start with one that just stuck into me as I was reading it, which is that idea of multi-class. And, and multi-class is an interesting one because if you look back at sort of different editions of D&D, &D, you can see how well or poorly certain concepts catch on. So in third edition, um, multi-classing could tell a much broader story. And like it really felt like story versus mechanical outcome. Um, and, and it was more obvious to the person and I'd say in older editions as well, right? So like being a fighter thief or being a, uh, wizard thief, you know, those things had a, a sort of resonance to them that, that stood out during play. It's a little less obvious what your character is in more recent editions. Um, and that's worth keeping in mind around multi-classes. Can you create that feel? The other thing is that multi-class often has rested upon something else that wove it together. So third edition is, is a great example of this, where 
if you were a rogue and a wizard and then you took arcane trickster suddenly your theme really really cemented together and it was very different than choosing arcane trickster as a rogue subclass um same thing with something like the arcane archer right like just these were way more tangible they had a lot more mechanics that baked in and created that theme and and so that's worth considering whether whether the the player will get enough out of that concept when you're going through multi-class class versus subclass that i think from my perspective a new class occurs very seldomly because it has to carry so much thematic weight that it really needs to be its own concept to stand and it, and it's hard to do like think of how few wizard classes or spell casting arcane spell casting classes there have been over the years right the warlock right the sorcerer there's not a lot else that's worked because just trying to add something else to that, you end up back at saying, well, that's kind of really close to this with a little bit of story to it, right? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, coming at it from a different angle, but making the same point is in class-based role-playing games, the classes are there because they represent to the player ways that their character will see the world and interact with the world in, in the story, but interact with the game in terms of the mechanics. So if a player comes to me and says, I need, I want to use this other subclass or I want a new class. My first question is why, what do you want to do? What in the current system is not allowing you to interact with the story in or the world in terms of, right. Uh, in terms of the rules, in terms of the story, that you can't do with a background, that you can't do with a feat, that you can't do. And and if they really have something that's important to them that the game's current rules aren't doing, then we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. For me personally, though, if it's, well, I'm a wizard, but I don't like getting hit, so I want a subclass that gives me a higher armor class, then I'm like, no. Uh, right the game is there that's the trade off in the game so th that for me is sort of the most important question what does the player want from the these classes and if it's something that if it's something that's reasonable and that makes sense for the game i'm running we'll find a way to do it maybe it is make a whole new class but maybe it's just find a way to tweak the current rules uh and and move forward from there yeah, and and thinking a little more about additions, you know, 4E was easier to have classes in, right? So you had things like the battle master or the warden, and they could all be different types of defenders, right? And and tanky mm -hmm. characters, because that really could work to express itself that way. It was a lot easier to make a scion, and and you see when D and D has played with like making a, a psionicist type class, it's it's had trouble doing so, because even when you say that it's different, you run into well. But don't don't I end up wanting to mimic what spells already do? So am I just using a spell list? And 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 even the D and D designers have trouble with that. And and it really is based on on the architecture of the edition. So yeah, if, if you're just if you know if you're designing is one question for for many people, that's, that's a lot harder consideration. If you're doing it for a home game, then I agree that you first still want to ask, do I really need this? And can the character get what they want in a different way? Um, but but at the same time, you have that latitude of building something custom just because you think you should. Uh, the Gunslinger is maybe a great example of a 5e version, right, where where Matt Mercer's Gunslinger does carry a different, very different theme. And it can have its own mechanics right around the, the, the use of these types of weapons and how that works and what's going on and the larger concept of powers that and can be fun. Mm hmm. Uh, next, we get a question from Michael Phillips via Mastodon. He says, you said a thing about wizards deciding to use people's creative commons material being bad press for them. And that feels very unfortunate because part of why the creative commons exists was to encourage that sort of thing. If you're under a CCBY license, you're putting stuff out there with the hopes that other big companies are going to pick up your material because they're also going to credit you for it. And that very, very well may be true, 
that doesn't change the fact that Wizards has to be very wary of public perception, not just among their players, but their fans, the investors in Hasbro, just the general public. Uh, they could do everything perfectly legally. They could do it to with the best of intentions. They could even do it in a way that multiple people benefit. But if one person out there says, look, Wizards stole my thing and they didn't pay me or they didn't give me enough. And I know that the Creative Commons license legally takes care of that. But we're in a post-truth world, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> and there's there are plenty of folks out there on social media, bloggers, reporters, whoever, who are just waiting for the next screw up from Wizards, whether it's perceived or real to get their clicks, right? To get the clickbait going, get the outrage going. And so while legally wizards would totally have the right to do whatever they wanted with that material, that's as long as it's covered by that license, it may not make sense for them in a public relations manner to do so. Yeah, and, and I think wizards, uh, they want to feel like they are the number one design shop out there. That may or may not be true, and you you know we we can all disagree on to what extent they are or aren't. But that is a feeling that they want to cultivate, and it can make sense to do so from a marketing perspective. And and so they want to feel like their work is official, it's premier, that their designers are the best. And the more that they were to rely on someone else's random work that pulled pulled from different sources, the less it feels that way, right? It feels like well anybody can create if Wizards is making their stuff official, right? Then then what separates them from us? Nothing. Right. So maintaining that illusion of it, whether it's an illusion or not, you know, you can decide makes some business sense. Right. To, to say our stuff is, is at a different level. And in fact, it does usually go through steps that other companies work or freelancers work. Uh, independent creators work does not go through and through a level of perspective and years of analysis and so on. That's different. So it, it should be different. But but there's both that reality and perception. And I think that perception carries a ton of weight. Mm -hmm. For sure. And the last question, oh boy, I have to say this, from Tejas Kudva2543 via YouTube. I'm so sorry I that went to 2,542 oh. other Tejas Kudvas existed beforehand. I, I, That's how yeah, it works, right? It must be a common name. Yeah. It was a good year for that name at one point, apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Gumshoe hoping to fix my lack of competence with mystery adventures. I found that the mechanics mimicked stuff I did as a GM anyway, although mechanizing the automat automaticity of clues, the automatic nature of clues and the resource management of extra information discovery was cool. But my main problem seemed to be exacerbated by the system. Namely, I'm terrible at writing good mysteries, and Gumshoe, even more than other adventures, really relies on the game master making a story with a really solid spine and needs cool information for those investigation spends to uncover. Published adventures were great, but even trying to follow their advice, I found my session prop when trying to write my own scenarios was long and untimely, or and ultimately kind of a failure. Maybe a better question then is what are some good resources for writing a mystery? Mm. Cheos, take it away. Uh, it, it's hard. Uh, this is a hard thing. And, and, and I, I think everybody to some extent struggles with this, but there are some good examples out there that you can emulate. And so a good thing to do is, is steal from what you see uh, that does work, that does it well. Um, two things I'll mention uh, quickly. One of them is, is my own, and I apologize for that. But I, I really like uh, or actually two, two that, that aren't mine. Uh, Sinister Secret of Salt Marsh, right? At a very simple level, has that sort of feel to it of a mystery. And you start going through in a dungeon. It's sort of a dungeon mystery, right? What is this old house about? And it does so in a very pleasing way. And, and if you've run it, uh, it's kind of surprising how interested characters get in what's going in, going on and, and what this, this the Sinister Secret is. Um, the fourth edition adventure, Infernal Wrath by Logan Bonner, which you can find in Dungeon 205, available on DriveThru um, or DMs Guild. That adventure breaks each day into segments to limit how much clue finding players can do in a day, which then ties to things that are happening where every night there is a murder. So you get this sort of doling out of clues 
uh, a sense of urgency. There's only so much you can look into, but you have a lot of freedom to look into things. That's a, a really neat structure to, to use. Uh, one that I did when I wrote and I borrowed heavily is in, in The Adventure of the Artifact, I emulate the board game Clue, right? And I make it very clear to the players almost at the start, you need to figure out who did it and with what item. And that will lead to the resolution, right? And that creates a nice mystery um, that, that everybody is very tangible. The goal is very obvious. And I think that's the main thing that Gumshoe is teaching you, right? Is whatever you come up with as, as your mystery and the structure around it, it needs to be very clear, right? People are getting murdered every night. You must figure out who did it. There's only so much looking you can do in a day, right? Those kinds of parameters are, are very helpful. You can look to movies and novels, but keep in mind that movies and novels often speak to the viewer or reader. And so those, that make, can actually make it hard to, to emulate them perfectly. So you've got to kind of adjust for that factor. John, thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, the gumshoe system is much like the 4E skill challenge system. Mm -hmm. And what they did really more than being revolutionary was just to force game masters to think about what they were running, the encounters, their adventures in a new way. So I will not apologize for pointing to my own work. Uh, I, I ran or I wrote a series of blogs for D&D Beyond called Let's Design an Adventure. And in that, I talked about designing encounters, but keeping different elements in mind for each encounter that you write. And three of those elements were, what do the characters know when they go into an encounter? What do the characters learn when they enter the encounter? And what is the goal of the encounter? And does that goal change within the encounter? So if you think, and there are several more elements, but I'm just going to stick with those three. So if you think about an investigation, the important part is the characters can get from point A to point B. That's the important thing. So that's what Gumshoe says. Don't And Gumshoe was basically trying to fix Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> that's basically why mm -hmm. it was written, to, to run Call of Cthulhu adventures without getting lost. So it's, boom, there's your clue. So you know you go from encounter a to encounter b great what are the other clues what do these other clues that you can find and that you can spend points on to learn why are they important mm -hmm. and how you can make those important is go to what i said and plan your encounters especially your following encounters with those clues in mind so what do the characters know going into an encounter can make that encounter much easier so if you say, all right, they go from encounter A to encounter B, encounter B is going to be difficult. But if they spend or if they make the check or if they do whatever, now encounter B is going to be a little easier because they know about the secret door. The secret door would then be something that they can either enter through or that they can watch out for that enemies may come through. Mm -hmm. They may learn that the person they think they're tracking as a witness is actually very dangerous. And they learn where that witness is with that first free clue. But the second clue points to the fact that, you know what? This witness, this person who I think is a witness who we're trying to question, is actually a very powerful mage. That's important to know. And so those sorts of things, you just have to sort of move backward in your design rather than forward. Forward is how do I get from A to B? Backward is what do I put in B that can be affected by what happens in A? Yeah. So those are the things. And, and that's hard to see in movies, in books, even in video games. But it's something that in game design, especially RPG adventure design, is something that you can do. And it generally, if you spend the time doing it, makes for much more varied and much more entertaining encounters yeah. in the long run. Speaking to that entertaining part, you know, if you think about like uh, Agatha Christie type murders, one of the funny things about them is, uh, and this is true of like the, the Knives Out series, anybody could have done it. Like, like at right. some, you get to some point in the book or the novel and the outcome can be almost random. And in fact, in the artifact, I made it random. Like you, you decide at the beginning of the adventure, you can pick or roll to determine who's guilty. Right. Because 
they all have reasons. That's why this is a mystery is because anybody could have done it. Right. And that kind of Agatha, Agatha Christie thing. The fun isn't in unraveling necessarily the truth because the truth is almost arbitrary. Right. That's why you've set it up to be hard to figure out because it really could have been anybody. Uh, it's the interaction with those people. So so a lot of your emphasis should be on those interactions that make it fun and give the players that answer. And that's the satisfaction of it is going through those discussions, going through those investigations, getting those clues. And then, you know, knowing that you did the right thing is, is the feel good. Right. So so focus on that aspect of it and less on whether it's an amazing plot and scenes mm -hmm. can feel pretty open and still be hugely pleasing. Like there's an adventure out there and I forget what the name of it is, or I'd say it, but it's one of the early um, uh, season two or season one adventures league that is a mystery. And I remember when I read it, I thought to myself, I don't know if this has a lot to it. And then in play, I was shocked at how the players were super engaged with just a few things in each of these mystery scenes where they'd investigate and talk to people and, and have a blast. Mm -hmm. And it partly it was because there was that investment done to give you enough detail and character to each of the NPCs or places to make it interesting to interact with them. And that's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. And a, a whodunit is very different than a conspiracy mm -hmm. is very different than, you know, all different sorts of mysteries. And some are more likely to be, be played well in D and D because, you know, mysteries, mysteries are the detective failing over and over again until they have failed enough that they succeed, mm. right? They, they look at the crime scene and they don't get their answer mm. right. They just find a piece of an answer. And so mm. whodunits are tough in D&D, especially at high levels, when certain spells can just tell you who done it. Uh, mm. So also the kind of mystery that you're trying to tell will be affected by all of this. Yeah. But it is a great question. And I hope our answers were at least somewhat helpful. And now we have some news to talk about, starting with the DMs Guild Design Dash. Uh, the Design Dash is a streamlined co or streamed contest run by the DMs Guild. A prompt is given, and the designers must come up with a design. They've ran they've run it a few times, but they are looking for designers to do it. And we have a link in the show notes where you can sign up to come on the show and do your thing. Yeah. Good luck if you go. Have you been on it, Taz? I was invited. I felt like I could only lose by going on it. I either, either I'd win and I'd feel bad about winning because I'd feel like I've done a lot of design, like, you know, in short pressure, or I'd feel like I lost and, and why did I lose? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, 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 <laughs> yeah. and I, and also just, I don't want to take up a slot from someone else. Like someone else should be on that show. Yeah. So, I think someone had canceled and they asked, do you want to be on it? And I said, ah, you know, I just sort of feel like I don't need to be on this. But but um, but it is a fun. What I do like doing is listening to it. And, and I've, I've listened to several mm -hmm. episodes back when they were doing them more regularly, where it is really fun to be like, OK, you know, you've got this bit of information, make an encounter, make an adventure, you know, that kind of thing. It is pretty satisfying. That's a neat, neat way to quiz yourself. But. I've got plenty of work, so I feel like I'm design dashing all day. <laughs> yeah, so that's the story of some of our lives. Mm -hmm. It's not a dash, though. It's a marathon. <laughs> the series of dashes. Uh, Big scary. Bad is exactly a series of 1,100 meter dashes. Big Bad Con online has concluded, but you can see portions of that convention uh, on video. There are topics such as making games uh, for hard conversations, putting your best foot forward in industry meetings, actual play technical production, safer games, uh, TTRPG creation from ideas to publication, join in the game industry from other walks of life and more. All of that is available on YouTube if you search on Big Bad Con online. And we also have a link in the show notes. Uh, I big bad con is one of those ones that I want to get to. I haven't been able to yet, but Same. I'm hoping sometime soon. Uh, the Diana Jones has announced it's emerging designer program finalists. We have names, including Aaron Roberts, Anthony Joyce Rivera, 
Bashir Gauss, uh, Allison Saib, and others. A link on Twitter, if you search the Diana Jones Award, will tell you everything that you need to know. Fantastic. Uh, do you miss, Sean, the days when you were emerging? I, I don't remember ever emerging. <laughs> I am still in the fetal position under my desk. Someday I hope to emerge yeah, from that. Yeah. But no, yeah. it's 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 great that I wouldn't call some of those people. I'm well aware of their work, right? And they're they're emerged. They're fully emerged. They are incredible, uh, you know, designers in their own rights right now. Yeah. But so emerged. We'll, yeah. we'll call them emerging. Why not? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So tell me about this uh, Whiz Kids board game. I mean, I I'm always shocked that there is yet another board game coming out by WizKids. And here's another one. Trials of Tempest is a D&D &D party versus party game, competitive slash collaborative, meaning you collaborate with your team members, compete against the other team. So there are two teams of one to four players for two to eight total, if, you, if my math is right. And you are rival parties of heroic adventures battling to prove your worth and metal in the ever changing battle realms of Tempest God of War, which is, I think, how, how they're explaining that there's like a little kind of grid you're playing on. That is the battle realm. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an article on GameSpot, which describes the challenge the designers faced in trying to keep it to under two hours with eight people, the inspiration for the game, and a lot of other angles like that. So you can read on it and see whether it fits your interest level. It is a link in our show notes. Game comes out in August, and it's uh, $100 or $200 for the version with painted WizKids minis. So. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the P versus P, especially party versus party mm -hmm. stuff. I know a lot of people have had fun with it over the years at conventions. They had all sorts of there were names for them that that are slipping my mind. But mm -hmm. it just if if you're using D&D &D rules, it just goes on for so long because characters are not meant to die in D&D. &D. <laughs> yeah. uh, so. But I mean, I assume these use different rules. So yeah, I think so. It'll be yeah. okay. But, but still, I, I, yeah, it's it still not super. Come in under two hours. Yeah, yeah, it's not my my thing or or my time frame for sure. But uh, but uh, you know, it's obviously a style of play that people do enjoy. But not as much as they're going to enjoy this next thing, Sean. I know. I was going to say segue. I know something that Teos doesn't enjoy. He enjoys underwear, but not just any kind of underwear. D and D underwear. The company Swag S W A G has D and D boxers available. Not a box set. Boxers for only fifteen dollars. You can cover your privates with ampersands <laughs> and the art from the D and D red box set. Yeah, yeah, Sean. If that doesn't I, complete your Tinder profile, I don't know what will. It it does. It does. I. I now know what I'm going to be recording in from now on. Uh, perfect for prom night. Uh, perfect mm -hmm. for that special anniversary with your partner. Mm -hmm. um, really, yeah. there's so many applications to these. Uh, I, I'd i say tip of the hat to whoever designed the kind of so, subtle working of ampersands all throughout. I do think the mm -hmm. box set image of the red box being on one side, I'd rather it be on both cheeks, but you know, still $15. A plus product. Mm -hmm. If this were just in Target, we'd be at the baloney levels, but it's close. It's another yeah. try. Yep. It's it's a specialized thing. It's not mm -hmm. worldwide that you could just go down to your local, you know, clothing store and, and grab them. But you know, if you're going to you can't go commando unless <laughs> you are uh if you are wearing D D uh boxers. But speaking of commando. Yeah. We have Rob Schwalb blogging about traditions and spells in his new game, Shadow of the Weird Wizard. So we talked about Shadow of the Demon Lord a, a while ago. Rob is making a less dark and more fantasy version of the rules with some alterations called Shadow of the Weird Wizard, which he said would be kickstarting sometime late spring, early summer. And now he has a blog talking about how spells will, will work in this new game. And I'm going to hand it over to Teos to talk about that. Yeah, it's cool. I mean, if you recall our coverage of the RPG and these ideas of sort of like being a novice or a master, an expert, 
So there are those kinds of, of breakdowns for spells. So spells are grouped into flavorful traditions, and then they're organized into these tiers like novice. So you could pick up war magic, the tradition, as a novice, and you learn a starting spell, and then later you pick up expert spells and so on. Um, these spells have casting times built into them rather than this being a uh, you know standard rule across everything. Um, and you don't get um, a pool of spells like spell slots. Instead, you can say that the spell will say, you know, you can cast it three times or once or whatever or all the time. Um, so that's kind of neat. You know, they're, they're differently balanced that way kind of into the system because the idea is that you're not spell casting quite as much as you would in D&D, &D, it seems. They give you several spell examples in the blog, and they are every bit the evocative nature you would expect from Rob's work. One of the spells is called Break the Rules, and it's clearly Rob's version of Wish or Miracle, and uh, it's a fun. So I enjoyed the, the blog. Link is in our show notes, or go to schwabentertainment.com. Yep, still looking forward to seeing the final version of that. And last but not least... You've been getting around, Teos. That's all I have to say. We had we had Ben on the show. Um, yeah, Ben Byrne was on a couple weeks ago, and through a complicated trade worthy of the National Basketball Association, there you go, Mike Shea. That's our sports reference. Uh, we traded out, and Teos took my spot on the Eldritch Lorecast while I was away. And how did that go? Did they did they take it easy on you, or did they really let you have it? Uh, you know, a mix of both. We, we, uh, I thought I was getting there ready to record, but we chatted and then we recorded and then we chatted some more. We had, we were having a lot of fun. Um, and we talked all about the D and D summit. We talked some as well as tale about tales of the valiant, the, the new name for uh cold presses, black flag project. Um, it was, it was great. I, I loved being on there. I can see why you have so much fun and I always love watching you when you're on the, on the podcast. So so that was great. Uh, and the link is in the short show notes or just search for Eldritch Lorecast and it'll come up. Um, mm -hmm. And then continuing the, the sort of D&D uh, &D Summit thing, I've, I've uh, posted my latest on alphastream.org on the virtual tabletop, which was one of the things we talked about on the show. So you can find that on my blog. And, and I've got at least one more piece in me on the D&D uh, &D Summit to talk about the, the rules update. Awesome. Looking forward to that. That takes care of our news.